international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lynn thompson international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds matteo falcone by prosper merrimay on leaving porto vecchio from the northwest and directing his steps towards the interior of the island the traveller will notice that the land rises rapidly and after three hours walking over tortuous paths obstructed by great masses of rock and sometimes cut by ravines he will find himself on the border of a great maquis the maquis is the domain of the corsican shepherds and of those who are at variance with justice it must be known that in order to save himself the trouble of manuring his field the corsican husbandman sets fire to a piece of woodland if the flame spread farther than is necessary so much the worse in any case he is certain of a good crop from the land fertilized by the ashes of the trees which grow upon it he gathers only the heads of his grain leaving the straw which it would be unnecessary labor to cut in the following spring the roots that have remained in the earth without being destroyed send up their tufts of sprout which in a few years reach a height of seven or eight feet it is this kind of tangled thicket that is called a maquis they are made up of different kinds of trees and shrubs so crowded and mingled together at the caprice of nature that only with an axe in hand can a man open a passage through them and maquis are frequently seen so thick and bushy that the wild sheep themselves cannot penetrate them if you have killed a man go into the maquis of porto vecchio with a good gun and plenty of powder and balls you can live there in safety do not forget a brown cloak furnished with a hood which will serve you for both cover and mattress the shepherds will give you chestnuts milk and cheese and you will have nothing to fear from justice nor the relatives of the dead except when it is necessary for you to descend to the city to replenish your ammunition when i was in corsica in eighteen blank matteo falcone had his house half a league from this maquis he was rich enough for that country living in noble style that is to say doing nothing on the income of his flocks which the shepherds who are a kind of nomads lead to pasture here and there on the mountains when i saw him two years after the event that i am about to relate he appeared to me to be about fifty years old or more picture to yourself a man small but robust with curly hair black as jet an aquiline nose thin lips large restless eyes and a complexion the colour of tanned leather his skill as a marksman was considered extraordinary even in his country where good shots are so common for example matteo would never fire at a sheep with buckshot but at a hundred and twenty paces he would drop it with a ball in the head or shoulder as he chose he used his arms as easily at night as during the day i was told this feat of his skill which will perhaps seem impossible to those who have not travelled in corsica a lighted candle was placed at eighty paces behind a paper transparency about the size of a plate he would take aim then the candle would be extinguished and at the end of a moment in the most complete darkness he would fire and hit the paper three times out of four with such a transcendent accomplishment Matteo Falcone had acquired a great reputation. He was said to be as good a friend as he was a dangerous enemy. Accommodating and charitable, he lived at peace with all the world in the district of Porto Vecchio. But it is said of him that in Corte, where he had married his wife, he had disembarrassed himself very vigorously of a rival who was considered as redoubtable in war as in love at least a certain gunshot which surprised this rival as he was shaving before a little mirror hung in his window 
was attributed to Matteo. The affair was smoothed over, and Matteo was married. His wife, Giuseppa, had given him at first three daughters, which infuriated him, and finally a son, whom he named Fortunato, and who became the hope of his family, the inheritor of the name. The daughters were well married. Their father could count at need on the poignards and carbines of his sons-in-law. The son was only ten years old, but he already gave promise of fine attributes. On a certain day in autumn, Matteo set out at an early hour with his wife to visit one of his flocks in a clearing of the Maquis. The little Fortunato wanted to go with them, but the clearing was too far away. Moreover, it was necessary someone should stay to watch the house. Therefore the father refused. It will be seen whether or not he had reason to repent. He had been gone some hours, and the little Fortunato was tranquilly stretched out in the sun, looking at the blue mountains, and thinking that the next Sunday he was going to dine in the city with his uncle, the caporal, when he was suddenly interrupted in his meditations by the firing of a musket. He got up and turned to that side of the plain whence the noise came. Other shots followed, fired at regular intervals, and each time nearer. At last, in the path which led from the plain to Matteo's house, appeared a man wearing the pointed hat of the mountaineers, bearded, covered with rags, and dragging himself along with difficulty by the support of his gun. He had just received a wound in his thigh. This man was an outlaw, who, having gone to the town by night to buy powder, had fallen on the way into an ambuscade of Corsican light infantry. After a vigorous defence, he was fortunate in making his retreat, closely followed and firing from rock to rock. But he was only a little in advance of the soldiers, and his wound prevented him from gaining the Maquis before being overtaken. He approached Fortunato and said, You are the son of Matteo Falcone? Yes. I am Giannato Piero. I am followed by the yellow collars. Hide me, for I can go no farther. And what will my father say if I hide you without his permission? He will say that you have done well. How do you know? Hide me quickly, they are coming. Wait till my father gets back. How can I? Malediction! They will be here in five minutes. Come, hide me, or I will kill you. Fortunato answered him with the utmost coolness. Your gun is empty, and there are no more cartridges in your belt. I have my stiletto. But can you run as fast as I can? He gave a leap and put himself out of reach. You are not the son of Matteo Falcone. Will you then let me be captured before your house? The child appeared moved. What will you give me if I hide you? said he, coming nearer. The outlaw felt in a leather pocket that hung from his belt and took out a five-franc piece which he had doubtless saved to buy ammunition with fortunato smiled at the sight of the silver piece he snatched it and said to gianetto fear nothing immediately he made a great hole in a pile of hay that was near the house gianetto crouched down in it and the child covered him in such a way that he could breathe without it being possible to suspect that the hay concealed a man he bethought himself further, and, with the subtlety of a tolerably ingenious savage, placed a cat and her kittens in the pile, that it might not appear to have been recently disturbed. Then, noticing the traces of blood on the path near the house, he covered them carefully with dust, and, that done, he again stretched himself out in the sun with the greatest tranquillity. A few moments afterwards, six men in brown uniforms with yellow collars and commanded by an adjutant were before Matteo's door. This adjutant was a distant relative of Falcone's. In Corsica, the degrees of relationship are followed much further than elsewhere. His name was Teodoro Gamba. He was an active man, much dreaded by the outlaws, several of whom he had already entrapped. Good day, little cousin, said he, approaching Fortunato. How tall you have grown. Have you seen a man go past here just now? 
"Oh, I am not yet so tall as you, my cousin," replied the child, with a simple air. "You soon will be. But haven't you seen a man go by here? Tell me." "If I have seen a man go by?" "Yes, a man with a pointed hat of black velvet, and a vest embroidered with red and yellow." "A man with a pointed hat, and a vest embroidered with red and yellow?" "Yes, answer quickly, and don't repeat my questions." "This morning the curé passed before our door on his horse, Piero. He asked me how papa was, and I answered him— "'Ah, you little scoundrel, you are playing sly. Tell me quickly which way Gianetto went. We are looking for him, and I am sure he took this path.' "'Who knows?' "'Who knows? It is I know that you have seen him. Can any one see who passes when they are asleep? You were not asleep, rascal. The shooting woke you up. Then you believe, cousin, that your guns make so much noise? My father's carbine has the advantage of them. The devil take you, you cursed little scapegrace. I am certain that you have seen Gianetto. Perhaps even you have hidden him. Come, comrades, go into the house and see if our man is there. He could only go on one foot and the knave has too much good sense to try to reach the Marquis limping like that. Moreover, the bloody tracks stop here. And what will papa say? asked Fortunato with a sneer. What will he say if he knows that his house has been entered while he was away? You rascal, said the adjutant, taking him by the ear. Do you know that it only remains for me to make you change your tone? Perhaps you will speak differently after I have given you twenty blows with the flat of my sword. Fortunato continued to sneer. My father is Matteo Falcone, he said with emphasis. You little scamp, you know very well that I can carry you off to Corte or to Bastia. I will make you lie in a dungeon on straw with your feet in shackles, and I will have you guillotined if you don't tell me where Gianetto is. The child burst out laughing at this ridiculous menace. He repeated, My father is Matteo Falcone. Adjutant, said one of the soldiers in a low voice, let us have no quarrels with Matteo. Gamba appeared evidently embarrassed. He spoke in an undertone with the soldiers who had already visited the house. This was not a very long operation, for the cabin of a Corsican consists only of a single square room furnished with a table, some benches, chests, housekeeping utensils, and those of the chase. In the meantime, little Fortunato petted his cat, and seemed to take a wicked enjoyment in the confusion of the soldiers and of his cousin. One of the men approached the pile of hay. He saw the cat and gave the pile a careless thrust with his bayonet, shrugging his shoulders as if he felt that his precaution was ridiculous nothing moved the boy's face betrayed not the slightest emotion the adjutant and his troop were cursing their luck already they were looking in the direction of the plain as if disposed to return by the way they had come when their chief convinced that menaces would produce no impression on falcone's son determined to make a last effort and try the effect of caresses and presents my little cousin said he you are a very wide awake little fellow. You will get along, but you are playing a naughty game with me, and if I wasn't afraid of making trouble for my cousin, Matteo, the devil take me, but I will carry you off with me. Bah! But when my cousin comes back, I shall tell him about this, and he will whip you till the blood comes for having told such lies. You don't say so. You will see, but hold on. Be a good boy, and I will give you something. Cousin, let me give you some advice. If you wait much longer, Gianetto will be in the Marquis, and it will take a smarter man than you to follow him. The adjutant took from his pocket a silver watch worth about ten crowns, and noticing that Fortunato's eyes sparkled at the sight of it, said, holding the watch by the end of its steel chain, Rascal! You would like to have such a watch as that hung around your neck, wouldn't you? And to walk in the streets of Porto Vecchio, proud as a peacock. People would ask you what time it was, and you would say, look at my watch. 
when i am grown up my uncle the caporal will give me a watch yes but your uncle's little boy has one already not so fine as this either but then he is younger than you the child sighed well would you like this watch little cousin fortunato casting sidelong glances at the watch resembled a cat that had been given a whole chicken it feels that it is being made sport of and does not dare to use its claws from time to time it turns its eyes away so as not to be tempted licking its jaws all the while and has the appearance of saying to its master how cruel your joke is however the adjutant seemed in earnest in offering his watch fortunato did not reach out his hand for it but said with a bitter smile why do you make fun of me good god i am not making fun of you only tell me where gianetto is and the watch is yours fortunato smiled incredulously and fixing his black eyes on those of the adjutant tried to read there the faith he ought to have had in his words may i lose my epaulets cried the adjutant if i do not give you the watch on this condition these comrades are witnesses i cannot deny it while speaking he gradually held the watch nearer till it almost touched the child's pale face which plainly showed the struggle that was going on in his soul between covetousness and respect for hospitality his breast swelled with emotion he seemed about to suffocate meanwhile the watch was slowly swaying and turning sometimes brushing against his cheek finally his right hand was gradually stretched toward it the ends of his fingers touched it then its whole weight was in his hand the adjutant still keeping hold of the chain the face was light blue the cases newly burnished in the sunlight it seemed to be all on fire the temptation was too great fortunato raised his left hand and pointed over his shoulder with his thumb at the hay against which he was reclining the adjutant understood him at once he dropped the end of the chain and fortunato felt himself the sole possessor of the watch he sprang up with the agility of a deer and stood ten feet from the pile which the soldiers began at once to overturn there was a movement in the hay and a bloody man with a poignard in his hand appeared he tried to rise to his feet but his stiffened leg would not permit it and he fell the adjutant at once grappled with him and took away his stiletto he was immediately secured notwithstanding his resistance gianetto lying on the earth and bound like a faggot turned his head towards fortunato who had approached son of said he with more contempt than anger the child threw him the silver piece which he had received feeling that he no longer deserved it but the outlaw paid no attention to the movement and with great coolness said to the adjutant my dear gamba i cannot walk you will be obliged to carry me to the city just now you could run faster than a buck answered the cruel captor but be at rest i am so pleased to have you that i would carry you a league on my back without fatigue besides comrade we are going to make a litter for you with your cloak and some branches and at the cresboli farm we shall find horses good said the prisoner you will also put a little straw on your litter that i may be more comfortable while some of the soldiers were occupied in making a kind of stretcher out of some chestnut boughs and the rest were dressing gianetto's wound matteo falcone and his wife suddenly appeared at a turn in the path that led to the maquis the woman was staggering under the weight of an enormous sack of chestnuts while her husband was sauntering along carrying one gun in his hands while another was slung across his shoulder for it is unworthy of a man to carry other burdens than his arms at the sight of the soldiers matteo's first thought was that they had come to arrest him but why this thought had he then some quarrels with justice no he enjoyed a good reputation he was said to have a particularly good name but he was a corsican and a highlander and there are few corsican highlanders who in scrutinizing their memory cannot find some peccadillo such as a gunshot 
dagger thrust or similar trifles mateo more than others had a clear conscience for more than ten years he had not pointed his carbine at a man but he was always prudent and put himself in a position to make a good defence if necessary wife he said to giuseppa put down the sack and hold yourself ready she obeyed at once he gave her the gun that was slung across his shoulders which would have bothered him and cocking the one he held in his hands advanced slowly towards the house walking among the trees that bordered the road ready at the least hostile demonstration to hide behind the largest whence he could fire from under cover his wife followed closely behind holding his reserve weapon and his cartridge box the duty of a good housekeeper in case of a fight is to load her husband's carbine on the other side the adjutant was greatly troubled to see mateo advance in this manner with cautious steps his carbine raised and his finger on the trigger if by chance thought he mateo should be related to gianetto or if he should be his friend and wish to defend him the contents of his two guns would arrive amongst us as certainly as a letter in the post and if he should see me notwithstanding the relationship in this perplexity he took a bold step it was to advance alone towards mateo and tell him of the affair while accosting him as an old acquaintance but the short space that separated him from mateo seemed terribly long hello old comrade cried he how do you do my good fellow it is i gamba your cousin without answering a word mateo stopped and in proportion as the other spoke slowly raised the muzzle of his gun so that it was pointing upwards when the adjutant joined him good day brother said the adjutant holding out his hand it is a long time since i have seen you good day brother i stopped while passing to say good day to you and to cousin pepper here we have had a long journey to-day but have no reason to complain for we have captured a famous prize we have just seized gianetto sopiero god be praised cried giuseppe he stole a milk goat from us last week these words reassured gamba poor devil said mateo he was hungry the villain fought like a lion continued the adjutant a little mortified he killed one of my soldiers and not content with that broke caporal chardon's arms but that matters little he is only a frenchman then too he was so well hidden that the devil couldn't have found him without my little cousin fortunato i should never have discovered him fortunato cried mateo fortunato repeated giuseppe yes gianetto was hidden under the hay pile yonder but my little cousin showed me the trick i shall tell his uncle the caporal that he may send him a fine present for his trouble both his name and yours will be in the report that i shall send to the attorney-general malediction said mateo in a low voice they had rejoined the detachment gianetto was already lying on the litter ready to set out when he saw mateo and gamba in company he smiled a strange smile then turning his head towards the door of the house he spat on the sill saying house of a traitor only a man determined to die would dare pronounce the word traitor to falcone a good blow with the stiletto which there would be no need of repeating would have immediately paid the insult however mateo made no other movement than to place his hand on his forehead like a man who is dazed fortunato had gone into the house when his father arrived but now he reappeared with a bowl of milk which he handed with downcast eyes to gianetto get away from me cried the outlaw in a loud voice then turning to one of the soldiers he said comrade give me a drink the soldier placed his gourd in his hands and the prisoner drank the water handed to him by a man with whom he had just exchanged bullets he then asked them to tie his hands across his breast instead of behind his back i like said he to lie at my ease they hastened to satisfy him then the adjutant gave the signal to start said adieu to Matteo, who did not respond, and descended with rapid steps towards the plain.
Nearly ten minutes elapsed before Mateo spoke. The child looked with restless eyes now at his mother, now at his father, who was leaning on his gun and gazing at him with an expression of concentrated rage. You begin well, said Mateo at last with a calm voice, but frightful to one who knew the man. Oh, father, cried the boy, bursting into tears and making a forward movement as if to throw himself on his knees. But Mateo cried, Away from me! The little fellow stopped and sobbed, immovable, a few feet from his father. Giuseppa grew near. She had just discovered the watch chain, the end of which was hanging out of Fortunato's jacket. Who gave you that watch? demanded she in a severe tone. My cousin, the adjutant. Falcone seized the watch and smashed it in a thousand pieces against the rock. Wife, said he, is this my child? Giuseppe's cheeks turned a brick red. What are you saying, Matteo? Do you know to whom you speak? Very well. This child is the first of his race to commit treason. Fortunato's sobs and gasps redoubled as Falcone kept his lynx eyes upon him. Then he struck the earth with his gunstock, shouldered the weapon, and turned in the direction of the Maquis calling to Fortunato to follow. The boy obeyed. Giuseppe hastened after Matteo and seized his arm. He is your son, she said with a trembling voice, fastening her black eyes on those of her husband to read what was going on in his heart. Leave me alone, said Matteo. I am his father. Giuseppe embraced her son and, bursting into tears, entered the house. She threw herself on her knees before an image of the Virgin and prayed ardently. In the meanwhile, Falcone walked some two hundred paces along the path and only stopped when he reached a little ravine which he descended. He tried the earth with the butt end of his carbine and found it soft and easy to dig. The place seemed to be convenient for his design. Fortunato, go close to that big rock there. The child did as he was commanded. Then he kneeled. Say your prayers. Oh, father, father, do not kill me. Say your prayers, repeated Matteo, in a terrible voice. The boy, stammering and sobbing, recited the pater and the credo. At the end of each prayer, the father loudly answered, Amen. Are those all the prayers you know? Oh, father, I know the Ave Maria and the litany that my aunt taught me. It is very long, but no matter. The child finished the litany in a scarcely audible voice. Are you finished? Oh, my father, have mercy. Pardon me. I will never do so again. I will beg my cousin, the caporal, to pardon Gianetto. He was still speaking. Matteo raised his gun and, taking aim, said, May God pardon you. The boy made a desperate effort to rise and grasp his father's knees, but there was not time. Matteo fired and Fortunato fell dead. Without casting a glance on the body, Matteo returned to the house for a spade with which to bury his son. He had gone but a few steps when he met Giuseppe, who, alarmed by the shot, was hastening hither. What have you done? cried she. Justice. Where is he? in the ravine i am going to bury him he died a christian i shall have a mass said for him have my son-in-law teodoro bianchi sent for to come and live with us end of matteo falcone by prosper merrimay